بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين وآخرين منهم لما يلحقوا بهم وهو العزيز الحكيم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم مثل الذين حملوا التوراة ثم لم يحملوها كمثل الحمار يحمل أسفارا بئس مثل القوم الذين كذبوا بآيات الله والله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته الى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين رب العالمين ثم أما بعد ونسجان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى I'd like to use this, these few moments we have together to share with you and for my own benefit a reminder from Surah Al-Jumu'ah and uh, as an introduction to what I want to share with you generally speaking too often we look at the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a book of knowledge and when we call it a book of guidance, we don't really appreciate what that means. What it means, it, ha- it has you know, serious, practical, relevant advice for our daily life. And when Allah Azza wa speaks, He's not talking about some abstract world or some abstract age that was long ago. It's talking about here and now too. It's relevant to us. And it's something we need counsel of. Nowadays, you know, when you think of someone, you, you need some advice. You have a problem, you need some advice. You got to talk to somebody. You think of everyone in the world, you don't think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't think of, yeah, I need some counsel from Allah azza wa jal. And the book of Allah is the counsel for the believer. Every few hours in our day, every few hours we, we engage in life, we have our problems in life, and then we are called back to seek counsel from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we ask Him for guidance, and then we recite something from His book subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that's a natural part of the life of the believer. But because we've become so distant even from the acts that are supposed to be those which bring us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the act of salah is Allah's, Allah's institution which keeps the believer connected to the Qur'an. Because when you make salah, the longest part is qiyam. And, and fil qiyam, what do we recite? We recite Qur'an. And it connects the believer to the Qur'an. But because we are living in a time where most of us are very disconnected from the Qur'an, we don't know what the book of Allah says. We don't understand the language, we know very little about what we, we memorize very little of it, etc. So generally speaking, we're not able to take benefit of the therapeutic advice and the counsel that Allah gives to the believer on a daily basis. Multiple doses every single day. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we take, we inshallah ta'ala listen to some reminder. It's not a tafsir session really. Uh, you know, in a tafsir you would have to really you know, study the scholarly positions of the ulama of, on every single word of the surah and then go into background information and linguistic analysis and all of these things but you know that's at a higher level right of, of ta'allum al-Qur'an but here what we're trying to do inshallah ta'ala is something more, far more basic just a reminder from the book of Allah because Allah and this is in the spirit of وَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيدٍ right remind with the Qur'an and when you give somebody a reminder you don't complicate it you simplify it so there are degrees of appreciating the Qur'an something can be very intricate and this is the beauty of this book it can be very simple it can be very complicated all at the same time. All at the same time. It, it, it depends on you know, what you need from this book, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who wants to dive deep, there's no end to the depth. 
And the one who gets, needs to get something immediate to benefit them, it has something immediate to benefit them too, subhanAllah. So we begin with this beautiful surah, this is from the surahs of, a series of surahs in the Qur'an that begin with the tasbih of Allah. سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ أو يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ They begin with the tasbih of Allah, they're called the musabbihat. As a group they are called al-musabbihat. These are all madani surahs. And in these surahs there's a common thread, there's a common thread. And that thread is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by de- telling us that everything in the creation declares Allah's perfection. And as soon as He tells us that, immediately He switches the subject to the human being. This is the common thread in all of these surahs. The first ayah in all of them always talks about everything else in creation. And then the next ayah and the rest of the surah talks about ourselves. Okay? And this is a very important uh, uh, lesson that Allah Azza wa teaches us in these surahs. Part of which is, <coughs> part of which is, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comparing the heavens and the earth, the, the physical creation of the universe, with the creation of ourselves, which is a more superior creation, according to Allah's own speech. He says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانِ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمٍ right? We honored the son of Adam. We are the children of Adam. And we created the human being in the best possible fashion. So Allah has honored the creation of the human being. So we are a creation superior even to the sky and the mountains and, and, and these kinds of things. Allah, this is a more marvelous creation. But at the same time, all of the rest of creation obeys Allah without question. All of the rest of the creation, Allah says to the heavens and the earth, اِئْتِيَا طَوْعًا أَوْ كَرْهًا Come forward, submit before me whether you like it or not. And they say, أَتَيْنَا طَائِعِينَ We submit before you in complete you know, obedience. They, they give in before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then this best of creation, when Allah Azza wa Jal commands this best of creation to submit, what happens? He, he, most, of the, most of mankind doesn't submit, and even the ones that submit, submit sometimes and don't submit other times, like most of ourselves. We submit partially and we're not really consistent with our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I told you, these surahs, these musabbihat are Makki or Madani? They're Madani, they're Madani surahs. And in the Madani Qur'an, the primary audience is the Muslims. In the Meccan Qur'an, the primary audience is the non-Muslims, the Quraysh. It's big, it's da'wah to them. But now the Muslims have formed a community. So when Allah speaks, He speaks about the issues of the community. You know, the ahkam, the, the laws and revel, uh, you know, instructions, injunctions are revealed. This pertains to the issues of the Muslim community. So necessarily, all of these surahs are issues of the Muslim community. This is why I chose this surah, one of the musabbihat. Because I was asked to speak about some, something related to the issues of youth, and I talked about that a little bit yesterday, but I wanted to take a little bit of a different angle today, inshallah ta'ala, and talk about generally some important elements in the life of a Muslim community. What keeps a Muslim community alive? What keeps it sustained? What's its lifeblood? And how does Allah Azza wa Jal speak about this issue? And what happens when the Muslim community does not hold on to its life supply, its supply line? Then what happened? What are the consequences of that? Allah Azza wa Jal begins, everything in the heavens and the earth, whatever is in, in it, declares the perfection of Allah. يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Al-Malik, the king, Al-Quddus, the source of all purity, the ultimately pure and sanctified, Al-Aziz, the ultimate authority, Al-Hakim, the all-wise. So four names of Allah occur, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the beginning of this surah. This is one of the other things that makes this surah special is that typically we find two names of Allah Azza wa Jal. Ghafoorun Rahim, Azizun Hakim, right? Azizun Thuntiqam. But here we find Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim. Four names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a special status. Allah Azza wa Jal goes on, immediately starts talking about His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Huwa alladhi ba'atha fil ummiyyin. He is the one who appointed among the unlettered, among those who were not learned. Among those who were not learned. Remember we said we, Allah in these surahs, He talks first about the creation of the heavens and the earth, and immediately in the next ayah, what does He do? He talks about human beings. So immediately He mentions, He's the one who appointed among the people. The people who didn't know before, ummiyin, didn't know how to read or write even. Rasulam minhum, a messenger who came from among them. A messenger who came from among them. The word Rasul, Messenger, gets translated as cliché. It's an ism, what's called ism mubalagha, min bab fa'ul in the Arabic language. And what it implies 
is someone who has a very strong message to deliver and someone who is constantly delivering a message. Someone who is constantly delivering a message. It's a powerful word for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ What does this Messenger do that he's, he's raised or appointed from among them? يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ This is the first thing he does. He recites onto them his miraculous signs, Allah's miraculous signs. The first name of Allah mentioned was the King, Al-Malik, in the previous ayah. And the first thing we learn about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in this ayah is that he recites onto the people the signs of Allah. It's like the signs of the King. When you go into a kingdom, when you enter the borders of a kingdom, you see the flags of the kingship. You see the monuments built by the king. You see the soldiers wearing the uniform that remind you of the king. Right? They're signs of kingship. The first thing the messenger does, sallallahu alayhi wa he reminds people of the, the miraculous signs of that king. And by these miraculous signs, we mean the ayat of the Qur'an. The ayat of the Qur'an are the manifestation of Allah's kingdom on this earth, subhanAllah. يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ once he recites upon the ayat upon them, he purifies them. The second thing Allah tells us, he purifies them. You know the second name mentioned of Allah Azza wa Those of you who are in class today, you remember. The second name mentioned is Al-Quddus. The source of all purity. The second thing the Messenger does, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he purifies them. He وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And then وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them the law and the wisdom. Kitab, I didn't translate as book, I translated it as Law, kutiba alaykum as siyam, kitab Allahi alaykum. Kataba in Arabic doesn't just mean book, it means law also. He will teach them the book, it implies the instructions, the injunction, the sharia of Islam. He will teach them that. Now, who will give the law? The one who has the authority to give the law. So, the third name of Allah in the previous ayah was Al Aziz. Al Aziz is the authority, and then the messenger when he speaks, wa yu'allimuhumul kitab. Wa fil akhir, in the end, Al Hakim. When Allah Azza wa Jalla spoke about his names, the last name mentioned was Al Hakim, the wise. And here Allah says, Wal Hikmah. Right? That he te- the Messenger recites the ayat of the king, he purifies the people, he uh, teaches them the book and the wisdom, and then finally, finally, and fi- the wisdom that I just iterated, correlating with the last name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. But I want you to understand something about these four words. We pass over them in translation rather quickly. He recites the ayat. He purifies them, he teaches them the book, and he teaches them wisdom. There's a profound sequence here. The first thing you should know about this sequence is, Ibrahim alayhi salam asked the same dua. When last night, those of you that were there in Masjid Sinat, we talked about when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in dialogue with Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam said, رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Ibrahim alayhi salam asked that, you know, appoint a messenger from among them who will read your ayat to them. Doesn't that what it says here? He will read the ayat to them. Then he said he will teach them the book and the wisdom. Is that what we find here too? And then he said he will purify them. Do we find purification here also? We do, but there's a difference. The difference is over there, purification was at the end. And over here, listen again, he recites the ayat, he purifies them, and he teaches them the book and the wisdom. There's a change in the sequence. So the way Ibrahim alayhi salam asked his dua, and the way that Allah responded is different. This is actually a proof that the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam was accepted. This is a proof. But not only did Allah accept his dua, Allah azza wa jal perfected his dua. The better sequence that is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is that he will recite the ayat, he will purify them and then teach them. So, so uh, first the recitation or the reading on to the people, then the cleansing, the purification and then the education. This is what I wanted to highlight in this dars. What, is that, what does this mean, These three step, this three step process that is being talked about that Allah perfected for Ibrahim alayhi salam. And what is the wisdom behind it? Here are a few things. Number one, the ultimate da'wah of Islam, the thing that will move the hearts. It took people that used to bury their baby girls alive and even shook their hearts. These were bad people that turned into amazing people. What was it that, that, that gave them this change, that brought this change to them? It was two things. It was the character of a man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then that was strong enough and then couple that with the most amazing words ever heard on the face of this earth. The words of Allah Himself, the Qur'an. Right? Two things together. The amazing character of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and then the Qur'an. If you look at this ayah, it says, 
Who alladhi ba'atha fil ummina rasulan Is the man mentioned? He's mentioned, he's the, he appointed a messenger from among them So the man is mentioned And then immediately what is mentioned? Yatlu alayhim ayatih So the man, the messenger is mentioned And then what's mentioned? He recites the ayat, the Qur'an is mentioned These two things The character of the presenter of the da'i of Islam The munadi, munadiyan yunadi lil iman Right, this caller And the words, the most powerful words That can call somebody to Islam When these two things come together The worst of the worst can become the best of the best If there's any ounce of good in someone It will come out If da'wah, Allah will put the effect in da'wah When these two things come together Do these two things need to come together today also? Subhanallah We need to have people that are pe- Dua, da'is That are people of character that are people of character, that are role models, not just in their speech, but in their action. But on top of that, when they open their mouth, what should they be talking about? Quran. Yatlu alayhim ayati. This is the first thing this messenger did. He introduced people to the miraculous words of Allah. Nobody's words will have an effect on someone like Allah's words will have an effect on someone. Nobody's words. This is one of the core elements of da'wah that is explained in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing is introducing people to the word of Allah. And you know, if you know anything about the word of Allah, it talks about, it talks about the same thing in so many different ways. Because there are so many different kinds of people. This might click with this one, but that might click with that one. This, you know, the, the farmer hears something about farming and it clicks with him. The businessman hears something about business and it clicks with him. The young man hears something about youth and it clicks with him. Allah Azza wa Jalla has these different audiences and He addresses them in so many different ways. Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. This is part of the tarbiyah of the next wave of da'is in our country, in our country, in our community. Really, that we have to have du'at, inviters to Islam that know how to present the message of the Quran and beautify the words of Allah when they present it. And they, on top of that, be of course people of character. Yatlu alayhim ayati. Now that that has happened and people are shaken by the word of Allah. They're sh- literally shaken by it. What is the next thing that is mentioned? Well, he's a him. He cleanses them. He purifies them. Now, what is the logical sequence? What's the rationale between mentioning cleansing? And what does cleansing mean? When do you clean something? When do you purify something? When it's dirty. You purify something when it's dirty. So when they hear the ayat, it makes them think about themselves. And when they think about themselves, it makes them realize that there are some things in their character, there are some things in their life, there are some things in their actions, there are some things in their speech that makes them dirty. There's something dirty about them. And whatever that dirt is, now they feel bad about it, but feeling bad about it is not enough. You ever heard a khutbah where the imam recited the ayat from Quran and you felt bad about it because you, you realized the dirt inside of you? Right, you felt dirty, but then that's not enough because what's the next step that has to happen? You have to be cleansed. You can't stop there and feel bad and move. That's not a cleansing. That's the first step in this process. And too often in our communities, we stop at the first step. We remind people, and we stop there. You see, when you remind people, the very next step is the the harder part, the cleansing. And the cleansing is something that takes time. Just like when the cloth is dirty, it doesn't just wash off. You have to rub it, you have to put time into it and clean it up. It takes time. And the, the, the dirt in our character, it takes time to clean up. And this in the Prophet's life wasallam, happened through suhbah, happened through company. The, the sahaba were people, just regular people before they took shahada. You don't take shahada and all of a sudden become superman. That doesn't happen like that. You know, they were, they were drinking alcohol. Some of them were committing zina before Islam. Right? And may Allah reward them because they are, all of their sins are forgiven past Islam. Right? SubhanAllah radiallahu anhu ajma'in, the best of the best. But still, it's not an overnight transformation. Just hearing the message has moved the person. You put it in our times. Somebody hears the message of the book of Allah, they take the shahada. Does that mean they've become a cleansed person already? No, there's, there's more to be done. They've taken the biggest step, yes. Oh, you zakih him. And this comes from company. They were in the company of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, constantly listening to the advice, taking his tips on how to better themselves. He was correcting their behavior, telling them to pray like this, don't say this, say this, don't do this, do that, don't eat this, eat that. When this happens, do this, when that happens, do that. This is the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is the part of the learning in Islam that doesn't happen from a book, that doesn't happen from an MP3. It doesn't happen from a YouTube video. This is the part of Islamic learning that happens with who? With company, 
with company and the company of the, of, of the one that you learned from. So we have to be in good company if we need cleansing. And what's the place that Allah has granted us in, in this community where you find good company? The masjid. This is where we have to find good company. And that company should be made number one of reciting the ayat onto the people. And then to be among each other's company and to bring the good out in each other. And to, you know, when, you, when friends are together and one of you is not very good, you know, one of you is not very religious. And the others are stronger in their deen. This one friend, when he hangs out with them, he becomes stronger too. It, it has an effect on him. Right? And the reverse is also true. If you, all your friends are messed up and you're not that bad, if you hang out with them long enough, you'll get pretty messed up too. It works both ways. But here, wa yuzakihim, and the element of, of tazkiyah that I wanted to identify or highlight was that of company. Company, especially of scholars. Especially of scholars. If there are scholars in your community, find their company, sit in their midst. Find time to spend with them. If they're offering a halaqa, have the halaqa with them. Invite them to your house for dinner. Right? Have family relationships with, with the people of knowledge in your community. This is absolutely essential. It's a part of cleaning yourself, good company. So wa yuzakihim. But then, after the cleansing, then what's the next step? Is that enough? If that was enough, there wouldn't be more. He recited the ayat onto them. He, clean, he cleanses them. And then Allah says, He teaches them the book and the wisdom. He teaches them the book and the wisdom. So the next step is education. The next step is learning. Taking classes, sitting in a halaqas, learning, taking notes, memorizing, going over tajweed, studying tafsir, studying fiqh, studying aqidah, studying, learning. Does learning happen first or last? In this process? It's last. Too often we are learning, but we're not even moved by the word of Allah yet. We're not even bettering our company yet. And our, and our, our friends are messed up, our company is messed up, the way we spend our time is, 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 is really messed up, but we're concerned more about learning. And you know, there was a nation before us that was concerned about knowledge, but not about anything else. You know which nation I'm talking about? Bani Israel. They were concerned about knowledge. They're very knowledgeable. So knowledgeable, Allah says, وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ <laughs> They have knowledge. You know, يَعْرِفُونَهُ They recognize the Messenger That's knowledge. Right? مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا عَقَلُهُ Even after they understood it, that's knowledge. Ayah after ayah after ayah telling us Bani Israel had a lot of knowledge. They had a lot of knowledge. آتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ آيَاتِ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا Right? آتَيْنَاهُ آيَاتِنَا Actually. You know? So you, you find the, 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 the passage of Barsisa in, in Surah Al-A'raf. He was given ayat, he was given knowledge. He had a lot of knowledge. He slithered out of them. Right? So now here, the, 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 the third step is strong education. And yu'allimu is not like yukhbiru. Right? To inform people. Or to just give people a book. Yu'allimu is teach. And the tashdeed in, in Abab al-Taf'il, yu'allimu min, min ta'lim. What this illustrates is learning that is consistent over and over and over and over again. Regular halaqat, regular classes, regular sitting with the scholars, regularly asking questions, regularly getting answers, regularly reading. This is the regularity of learning has been mentioned here. Okay? Now he doesn't even just say, يُعْطِيهِمُ الْعِلْمِ He gives them knowledge. He doesn't say that. He says, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ He teaches them. He teaches them the book and the knowledge. So there's a difference here. So this is a three-step process. The first step was really da'wah. The, the first step was powerful da'wah. And what's the most powerful da'wah you remember what we said? The Qur'an itself. The book of Allah should be presented in a powerful way. That's the most powerful. No, nothing will move the people's hearts like the book of Allah will move the people's hearts. It came. Allah Azza wa says, if it was revealed on a mountain, what would have happened? You know, right? This is the Qur'an. This is the word of Allah that takes Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu who had buried his daughter alive and when he heard this word, he ran away. Was he behind the Khilaf of the Kaaba before Islam? He heard the Qur'an, he ran away. It had that effect on him. Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi heard the Qur'an, immediately took shahada. Immediately took shahada. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, the enemy of Islam, hated the Messenger wasallam. Hated him. Hamim al-Sajda is recited to him and he doesn't accept Islam, but he's crying. He didn't even accept Islam, he's still crying. SubhanAllah. The power of Qur'an even on the Kafir. Even on the Kafir. So this is powerful stuff. We're dealing with very powerful stuff. Don't underestimate the power of the, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyhow. So he says he teaches them the book and the wisdom. وَإِن كَانُوا مِن قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ And before this, they were in clear misguidance. They were clearly misguided. They were clearly lost. They were immersed in, in confusion. And you know what's funny? You have 
community after community after community in the United States asking their scholars, asking the Imam, asking any speaker who comes out, what should we do? We're confused. Allah says, before this you used to be confused. <laughs> now the clarification's here. Is, what, is that clear enough? The, the three-step process is very simple. Just follow it. Just institutionalize it. The question to ask is, how do we do it? Who do we, whose help do we need? How do we put this together in our masjid? Who are the people that can help with this project? With the project of getting the, the word of the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out presented to the young people, presented to the women in their halaqat, presented to the elders, presented to those who don't speak any English in their language. Present it at every level. Don't, don't be cheap with it and say, oh, we're, you know, we're only going to present it in English, or we're only going to present it in this one circle. You know, don't expect people to come to you, learn to go to the people. Learn to go to the people. Don't say we have a program, nobody shows up. No, 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 no. Go to them. Go to them. You have to learn to go to them. The Messenger ﷺ didn't stay home and invite people over. That was the beginning, right? He invited them for dinner, that didn't work. Now what does he do? Wasallam. <laughs> he goes to them. He goes to them. When he, they don't come to him, he goes to them. Sallallahu alayhi wa This is what we have to do within the ummah today. So yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim wa yuallimuhum al-kitab wa al-hikmah wa in kanu min qablu lafi dhalalin mubin wa akharina minhum lamma yalhaqu bihim Such a powerful ayah. And there are others besides them, meaning besides the Arabs, besides the Sahaba, who haven't even joined their ranks yet. You know Allah is talking already about the international nature of this ummah. He says, there are others who haven't even joined them yet. Who are these? Today these are the Turks, the Malaysians, the Africans, the European Muslims, the American Muslims, the Spanish Muslims. Muslims all over the world. Allah speaks about them in very simple terms. There are many others that haven't even yet joined them. And the wisdom of this ayah here, one of the gems of wisdom here is, we better have this process in place before the others join us. Because when they join us, what are they the most in need of? This three-step process. They're in need of this process. Today when the person takes shahada and it comes to one of our masajid, is this process in place? Is this available to them? Are the ayat of Qur'an being clarified and the da'wah being made from the member today? And if it's being made, then after that, is there company available in which they can cleanse themselves? And after that, are there scholarly circles where they can start learning? Is this mechanism institutionalized? This is a divine system. It's there, it works. It works. And if we can just implement it, in and of itself, it's a powerful, powerful solution for any, any, any community. And of course, there's room for creative execution of this strategy, but the general guidelines are incredible, they're really remarkable. وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ And He is the ultimate authority, the all-wise. ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ That is the favor of Allah, He gives it to whoever He wants. The favor here is the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa the favor here is the manhaj of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam the methodology of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam what is his methodology in one ayah yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim wa yuallimuhum alkitab wal hikma that is the favor of allah he gives it to whoever he wants meaning we should appreciate that these ayat are no small thing this is a favor of allah he could have given it to anyone he gave it to us he gave it to us yu'tihi man yasha wallahu Subhanallah. Wallahu dhul fadl azim. And Allah is the, in possession. He's the owner of the ultimate favor. Now He speaks of a people who lost this process. Who's those people? Bani Israel. Mathalu ladina hummilu tawrat, thumma lam yahmiluha. The example of those who were given the burden of Torah. They were given a book. The ayat were given. They were supposed to recite them, cleanse, teach. Thumma lam yahmiluha. They didn't carry them. They didn't carry that burden. The, the, the way to carry that burden has already been outlined. Right? And I won't repeat it again because it better be embedded in your mind by now. Right? ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا They did not carry that burden. كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ أَسْفَارًا It's like donkeys carrying books, low piles of books on their backs. It's like people having tons and tons and tons of knowledge or having access to tons of you know, fatwa websites or hadith search or Qur'an search or tafsir search. But none of it counts for anything because it's like donkeys with piles of books on their backs. They don't cleanse themselves. They're not moved by the ayat of Allah. There's no وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ imana. There's none of that. When the ayat are recited onto them, it increased, they increase them in iman. It doesn't happen for them. It's just dry knowledge for them. It's just interesting information. Or information to learn to spit out in a speech. That's all it's reduced to. Subhanallah. So here he says, ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا they, were, they did not carry that burden كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ أَسْفَارًا Just like the example of a donkey that is piled, books are piled upon 
بِئْسَ مَثَلُ الْقَوْمُ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ These are scary words. How horrible the example of the nation. He didn't even say Bani Israel. He said here, the nation. When he, when, he was a, when he uses a generic term, when he uses a generic term, you know what that means? This will be anyone who does this. Anyone who is guilty of this crime will fall under this ayah. Subhanallah. بِئْسَ مَثَلُ الْقَوْمُ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ How horrible the example of a nation that lied against the ayat of Allah. That didn't do justice to the ayat of Allah. They weren't true to the ayat of Allah. May Allah not make us from them. وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ And what is the ultimate punishment for people who don't appreciate Allah's book? When Allah gives them the book, and He tells them how to implement it in their life, in their society, in their community, the ultimate punishment of Allah before the hellfire is, Allah refuses to guide them, because Allah gave them guidance and they didn't appreciate it. So He says, وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِي Oh, it is Allah who doesn't guide the wrongdoing nation. In other words, they get guidance from elsewhere, which is nothing but misguidance. It is not Allah who guides them anymore. That's it. Allah gave them, they didn't appreciate. Those doors are closed. So when Allah gives us a gift, gift we appreciate, we beg Allah Azza wa we beg Allah sincerely that He make us of those who appreciate the guidance of the book and the sunnah of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ هَادُوا Say to those who are from the Jewish community, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ هَادُوا At that time, إِنْ زَعَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ لِلَّهِ If you are convinced that you are befriended by Allah, you are the close to Allah, you are the dear friends of Allah, and this is, is, is beautifully connected to what came before. You see, when the community loses the true essence of the religion, and all that is left is superficial knowledge, then you fill the void that was supposed to be in your hearts, there's supposed to be a fear of Allah. There's supposed to be an awe of Allah. There's supposed to be a constant urge to remember Allah. When all of that is gone, when all of that is de-emphasized in a community, then the only thing that's left is false assumptions that enter into your heart. Because the real love of Allah and the real fear of Allah and the real dhikr of Allah is no longer there, the, the, the vessel is empty, then you find other things fill that vessel. And one of the things that fills that vessel is an amal, what's called false hope. False hope. And one of the false hope is no matter how messed up I am, at least I say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah wasallam. So I could do whatever I want. Yeah, I got a liquor store, but it's not that bad, at least I say the kalima. At least I donate half the earnings in Ramadan to the masjid. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Dude, <laughs> they're donating from a liquor store to the masjid. Right? How, how much fitna will come out of that masjid? You know the, the, the Quraysh? The Quraysh, before Islam, when the Kaaba was damaged by a flood, they did a fundraiser to build, the, to reconstruct the Kaaba. And they refused to take money from alcohol, prostitution, and gambling. These were mushrikun. These were mushrikun. In our times, we have to fight to say, no, we're not going to take money from that source of income. And the guy will say, so what, what are you talking about? I'm, you know, I'm going to give this because this is my ticket to paradise by giving this money. Now I, I can feel good about still owning my haram business. Right? SubhanAllah, the, the, the state of affairs we've reached. So they assume they're awliya Allah. Allah says, مِن دُونِ nas, As opposed to other people, you're the special group. You're the ones that Allah really loves. If, if that's really your assumption, فَتَمَنَّهُ الْمَوْتِ Then wish for death. Then go ahead and wish for death. You know the, the believer, the true believer? You know one of the du'as in the Qur'an for the one who really feels iman in their heart is a really amazing du'a. You know how it ends? وَتَوَفَّنَا مَعَ الْأَبْرَارِ Give us death among the righteous. It's a du'a for death. But what kind of death? Among the righteous. Allah says if you're really that righteous, if you're awliyaullah, then you should be asking for what? Death. Death among the righteous. فَتَمَنَّهُ الْمَوْتِ Ask for death. You know, in, if you're so convinced that Jannah is waiting for you, and the endless gardens, and the, the lofts, and the beachfront properties, right? Waterfront properties, and no, no taxes to pay, no utility bills, right? You're not going to get older, there's no health insurance, no, none of these problems. Then you know what? Why are you wasting your time? You're guaranteed Jannah, man. Go. Ask Allah to take you there quickly. Why do you want to stay here and pay rent, and pay the property, and pay the car insurance, and fill up the gas every week, and... You know, eat this food and you don't even like how it's cooked. Why you gotta wait for all this? Just go. Ask Allah to take you there quickly. <laughs> if you're really that convinced that you are awliyaullah. So Allah calls them on their bluff. You see that false hope deludes them. They think we'll have good in dunya and Allah loves us so much. We can live it up here, party here and party there too. Because it's all good. We are awliya of Allah. 
And this is a false hope that, that even enters the heart of the believer who does not keep a healthy relationship in the methodology of the Messenger وسلم, with the Book of Allah. So in kuntum sadiqeen, if in fact you're truthful, then wish for it. وَلَا يَتَمَنَّوْنَهُ abada. They will never wish for it, ever. They will never wish for it, ever. بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ Why won't they wish for it? I mean, they are convinced that they are only Allah. But when you call them out, they, you know why they don't wish for it? Because of what, literally the expression is, because of what their hands sent forward. Now that's hard to understand in plain English, what my hands sent forward. What that means is, whenever you, you know, I can explain this to you in email terms. When you click the send button, can you get it back? It has been sent forward. Literally, it has been forwarded. Your email has been forwarded. When you do an act in this world, literally it is forwarded. It is forwarded to a hard drive over here and over here. There are two hard drives here. Right? It gets forwarded and it's stored in the hard drive. It's there. Can you unsend? No. So they've sent out, they've done a bunch of really messed up things and all, the record of all of them has already been forwarded. And they know that they have done so, mu- so many horrible things that they don't even want to think about it. And this is the psychology of the fasiq. You have to understand this, very important point. This is the psychology of the fasiq. The one who is so immersed in disobedience to Allah, the only way they can go to sleep as night, at night is that they just don't think about it. If somebody talks to them about death, somebody talks to them about what is waiting for them in the hereafter, don't want to hear it man. I don't want to talk about it. You know, because it's so scary that you'd rather not even deal with it. You know that one of the funniest things the ostrich does when the lion is coming at it and it can't run? You know what it does? It sticks its head in the ground. I don't want to face the facts. I don't want to deal with it. It's cool in here, it looks really nice. (laughs) You know, not facing reality. This happens to the one immersed, so immersed. I'd rather believe Allah loves me and I'm a, I'm a wali of Allah and somebody calls you on your bluff, I don't want to hear that bro. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to hear it. So this is the attitude of the fasid. These, these people have become that level of corrupt. And this happens in our communities, even in our families. Sometimes when you talk about how Allah loves us, how, how Allah will reward us, you know, people will listen to you. You talk about if we disobey Allah, there will be consequences. Can we stop talking about this depressing stuff now? Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the, you know, the, the, the Rockets game or something. This is, this is something that doesn't, I don't want to hear. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَتَمَنَّوْنَهُ قَدَّمَتْ بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ أَبَدًا بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِالظَّالِمِينَ And Allah is fully knowledgeable of wrongdoers. He has full account. He has full knowledge of the wrong that they're doing. The wrong in their attitude and the wrong in their actions. قُلْ Say, إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ the, the death that you are fleeing away from, the death that you are running fast away from, فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ Then it is that same death that is going to have a meeting with you. مُلَاقِيكُمْ It will come to have a meeting with you. <laughs> right? You can't avoid that meeting. Can't get away from it. You know, if you have a report card day at school, you could, you, a kid can like pretend to sneeze and cough, I don't want to go, I don't feel so good. Right? You can try to avoid the meeting. But there are some meetings you just can't avoid. You can't get away from it. This is one of those meetings. You are being rushed. You know, literally you are being, uh, you know, what are those things called? Not escalators. You know those things that go horizontal? Those, those conveyor belt things, right? You're on one of those. Whether you like it or not, you're moving forward. Whether you, like, you think you could face backwards, look this way, that way, you're moving forward. There's no way you're moving backwards now. You're only headed towards that meeting. All of us. فَإِنَّهُمْ مُلَاقِيكُمْ There's no doubt that it's going to come into contact with you, it's going to meet with you. ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ Then you will all be returned to the knower of the unseen and the seen. Meaning Allah knows the, the emptiness inside your hearts. Allah knows when you did good deeds, even they were done with wrong intentions. And Allah knows what was inside your heart. SubhanAllah. الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ The unseen and the seen. فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ then he will thoroughly inform you بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ about the things you used to do. He will thoroughly inform you about the things that you used to do. We're at the conclusion of the surah inshaAllah ta'ala. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا All those of you who believe. Is there, a, is there a switch in address? Who was Allah talking to a moment ago? Bani Israel. 
Now he's talking to, he's, he's, he's done with them. You're, you better get your act together. You've already failed. Let me talk to the believers. So you better not fail like them. You know how a father talks to his children? One of them failed, the other one has an exam next week. And he says, listen, Kareem, don't be like Salim over here. Right? Don't be like him. First, the, the father yells at this one. Then he turns to the other boy and says, listen, you, you better listen. Look, don't make those mistakes. Now, our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, much more concerned, infinitely more concerned than a father, first he scolds Bani Israel. But when he's done scolding Bani Israel, it's not so we can say, ha, look at how Allah hates Bani Israel. Man, they're cursed. No, wait, Allah didn't tell us about that because they're cursed. Allah told us about that so we don't go down that road. So he turns to us and says, you better not be like them. So he says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, idha nudiya ni salati min yawm al Whenever the call is made for the day of Friday, فَسْعَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Rush to the remembrance of Allah. What does Jummah prayer have to do with all of this? Jummah prayer is when the messenger recites the ayat onto the people. Jummah prayer is when you're supposed to be revived. The Jummah khutbah is the incredible institution of Allah where we have a weekly convention in this ummah. It's a weekly convention. When you have a special program, you have a lecturer coming, you have a speaker coming, does everybody show up? Everybody does. A lot of people show up, but not everybody. But there's one thing, whether you have a famous speaker, or you have a lame speaker, or you don't even have a speaker. <laughs> whether you have an imam, they didn't even show up. Does everybody still show up for Jummah? It's a divine institution, you see. You don't have to pass out any flyers. You don't have to send out any, fa any Facebook events. You don't have to send any emails. It's a program designed by Allah Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we never lose sight of the methodology of the Messenger sallallahu Whenever the call is made for the day of Friday, rush to the remembrance of Allah. Fas'aw ila dhikrillah. Rush to the remembrance of Allah. This institution is where the methodology is executed. This is where it begins. Which is why I argue in our practical context, the khutbah of Jumu'ah is the biggest amana, it is the biggest trust every masjid has. And the khutbah of Jumu'ah should be so powerful, and it should be so moving, that even the person who doesn't know anything about Islam, even they are rattled by it. Nobody should be yawning at the Jumu'ah khutbah, even if they're dead tired. It should be that exciting. It should be that good. And that's an amana, that's a trust of every masjid. They need to get the ayat into the people. That's the opportunity to get those ayat into the people. It's the Friday prayer. That is the, that's the responsibility of the Friday prayer. So, فَسْعَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ We're told, rush to the remembrance of Allah. Leave your trade behind. وَذَرُوا الْبَيَّةِ ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ And you know what's happened today? One of our great catastrophes, most people show up to Jummah before the khutbah or after the khutbah starts? After it starts. Most people show up afterwards. The majority of people show up when the iqamah is about to start. So do they get the remembrance of Allah? No, because they don't understand Arabic, so they don't understand the Salah. The only thing they would have understood is what? The khutbah itself, but they don't come for that. So we have to actually, we need to have khutbahs about coming early. We need to have khutbahs about coming early. So that we can revive this tradition. We've got to start that. When they get late, end the khutbah a little late. Take five extra minutes and just talk very strongly about how we need to come early for khutbah and how important it is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how important He made it to us that we rush to the remembrance of Allah and we leave the business behind that would be better for you if you knew and then Allah gives an example subhanahu wa ta'ala finally uh, to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً oh, uh, actually, when the prayer is done go spread out in the land pursue out of Allah's favor go back to your job go do your business but remember Allah a lot. You know how a person can remember Allah a lot? Most of the time, after Jummah, you figure the religious part of the day is done, now I can party. After all, it's Friday night. Right? Especially in America, right? But if you have a really strong khutbah, you know what's gonna last for you at least that day? A lot of remembrance of. Allah. So he says, وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So that you may succeed. May Allah make us from the successful. وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً أَوْ لَهْوَ And this is a specific case in the life of the Prophet ﷺ when he was giving the khutbah and a trade caravan was passing by and people rushed towards that caravan. People do that nowadays 
by saying salam and while they're saying salam they're actually they're kind of looking at their shoes where exactly they are because they're gonna rush towards them run 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 you gotta get out of there you have to get out of there and this is the attitude we've developed subhanallah so they rush towards the trade وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمَ in فَضُّوا إِلَيْهَا وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمَ they rushed towards it and they left you standing there by yourself قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٍ tell them what Allah has is better what does Allah have? Allah didn't even say what the messenger has is better Allah didn't even say the Friday prayer is better Allah said what Allah has is better and what Allah has وَاللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ خُسْلُ الْمَآبِ what Allah has is the reward Jannah tell them what business deal you're gonna strike that will get you Jannah what will get you that? come let me show you something that's better قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٍ مِنَ اللَّهْوِ وَمِنَ التِّجَارَةِ it's better than any entertainment, any movie that's going to start at 2.45 and Jum'ah ended at 2.15 so you'll have only half hour to make it to the movie theater it's better than that any entertainment or the finals game right, or the playoffs, whatever, this is better وَمِنَ التِّجَارَةِ and even any kind of business activity وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الرَّازِقِينَ and don't worry about it, you will not lose your business by coming to Jum'ah prayer because Allah says Allah is the best of providers SubhanAllah, Allah خَيْرُ الرَّازِقِينَ how beautifully placed why do people rush back after Jum'ah? Immediately, not even completing the salah properly. Why do they come late? Because they think the risk will be compromised. Allah says, come, Allah is the better provider. Allah is the best provider, subhanAllah. And so finally we conclude in, in this passage, there was this one ayah that I, I, I like to conclude and I promise I'm done. Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Remember Allah a lot so that you can succeed. I want to close with a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which ends with the same words. The Messenger of Allah told us, Ya Ahl al Quran, la tatawasad al Quran. Well, people of Quran, don't take the Quran lightly. Don't make, a, don't, don't make it a means to relax. What luhu haqqa tilawatihi min ana il layli wal nahar. And read and follow the Quran like it deserves to be read and followed in all hours of the night and day. And then he says, Wafshuhu, spread it. Wataghannuhu, and beautify it. Wataghannuhu, fihi. And reflect deeply in it. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So that you can succeed. The, the, the hadith began, Ya Ahl Al-Qur'an. Not even, Ya Ayyuhal Alladheena Amanu. Ya Ma'ashar Al-Muslimin. No, no, no. Ya Ahl Al-Qur'an. People of Qur'an. Allah, Allah's Messenger وسلم, called us the people of Qur'an. This is what should, we should be defined by. Our day should be spent in remembrance of Allah through His book. وَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيدٍ With that, inshaAllah ta'ala, I conclude. سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ نَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَّهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ نَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكَ وَنَحْمَتُ اللَّهِ وَرَكَاتُهُ InshaAllah ta'ala, I'll, uh, I don't really think I have any capacity to answer questions, but if you have any, I'll, if I can answer them, I will. Bismillah. Yes, go ahead. It's conditioning. It's con- yeah, he said, earlier I said, there, we have some filth in our body, but when we accept Islam, all our sins are forgiven. But that doesn't mean we're cleansed. In other words, our behaviors are still our behaviors. In other words, when you're, for example, when you're addicted to alcohol, taking the shahada, does that automatically get the addiction out of your system immediately? No. For if you're on drugs, you're not going to feel withdrawal when you take shahada? You'll still feel it. If you're addicted to smoking, when you take shahada, after you take shahada, you're still going to be addicted to smoking? Are you going to still feel, feel the temptation? Sure. It's not a, like, a, I took shahada, everything's go, okay now, you know, everything's taken out of my system. Allah's divine help will come, but you will have to get these habits out of your system and cleanse them out of your system. Yes, you are no longer held accountable for all the bad stuff you did, but now you need to make sure you don't go back into that bad stuff because you've been doing it for a long time. You know what's Pavlov's classical conditioning, right? You do something over and over and over again and you're just used to it. That's how you do things. That's how you do things. And it takes a real effort to get out of your conditioned bad habits. And really, for the youth, it's really bad habits. If there's a certain time where their parents aren't around, that's when you get on the computer. That's a bad habit. Right? There's, there's a certain friend, when you get together with them, bad things happen. That's a bad habit. These are the bad, and you do that all the time, so it becomes a cycle for you. You gotta get out of that cycle. You have to get out of it. You have to cleanse yourself with good company. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us good company. Yes? That last hadith that you mentioned, it says, don't take, uh, take Quran as entertainment. But what if somebody enjoys 
No, it's nothing to entertain me. It says, take it, don't take it lightly. Or don't turn it into a means of... Yeah, he said, uh, don't take the Qur'an as entertainment. Uh, that's not what the hadith actually says. It says, لا تتوسد القرآن. Tawassud in Arabic, it means a few things, but one of the meanings is, don't turn it into a pillow. In other words, don't relax with the Qur'an. What that means is, oh, we are the people of Qur'an, we're forgiven. I can relax now. No, don't relax with it. This is a book that demands struggle and reflection from you. Right? So don't be lax with the Qur'an would be a good way to understand that. We, of course, we enjoy the recitation of Quran, but we, I would, still wouldn't use the word entertainment, though. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Alright, inshallah. Shukran lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.